Um, today, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wanjiri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, emerging, to all of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff and students and guests with us today. On behalf of the Reconciliation Committee, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Associate Professor Duane Hamacher today. Duane joined the School of Physics at the University of Melbourne as an Associate Professor of Indigenous Astronomy and Science just three weeks ago. He works closely with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities across Australia and works to increase Indigenous representation in the astronomical and space sciences. He's earned degrees in physics, astronomy, and Indigenous studies, and was a recipient of an ARC DECRA fellowship where he worked with Miriam Elders to record and preserve the astronomical knowledge and traditions of Torres Strait Islanders. Working together with Marcia Langton, Twain wrote Indigenous Astronomy into the national curriculum. And he curates an impressive website for Aboriginal astronomy, including a number of amazing resources for staff, students, um, and teachers. Dwayne's seminar coincides with our NAIDOC week celebrations, with the theme of the NAIDOC with this year um, being voice, treaty, and truth. Today, we will explore truth-telling with Dwayne, and I hope that today, when you're on your way home, staring out to the sky, that Dwayne will have provided you with a new connection to Indigenous history. Dwayne, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to share your cultural and scientific journey with us. And everyone, I'd like you to please welcome Dwayne to Weihai. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. It's great to see a well, pretty substantial group going. We do have a few seats down in the front. Um, I'd like to begin by also paying my respects and acknowledging that we are on traditional Aboriginal land and pay my respects to Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and elders past, present, and future. And just as importantly, I want to recognize all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander custodians and elders and academics and scholars who have taught me quite a bit over the last 11 years that I've been working in this field. It's a very strange area to work in for an American guy. Um, when I came over from the US, I knew nothing about Australia, except for what I saw on Crocodile Dundee and Steve Irwin. I knew absolutely nothing about Aboriginal culture, and I had come down to study astrophysics. It was, you know, learning a little bit about some of the traditional knowledge was a, sort of a passing interest, but it wasn't my main focus. As I began pursuing a master's degree, or actually at the time a PhD in astrophysics, I became increasingly concerned about something that I saw, and that was a general attitude amongst scientists to completely reject uh, traditional knowledge and cultural information. And I thought, you know, this is something that I'm really passionate about learning more about. And I didn't know anything about it, like I said at the time. So I decided to do a master's degree in astrophysics instead, left the world of exoplanets, and enrolled in a PhD program at Macquarie University in indigenous studies. And I can tell you that was one hell of a learning curve for a guy who knew nothing about the subject coming from a background in physics. Um, I was very fortunate to have a lot of mentors and meet some local elders who were willing to sort of guide and, you know, advise and mentor this, you know, weird American guy trying to learn a little bit about Aboriginal astronomy. So I want to talk to you about today is some of the stuff that I've learned over the years, um, some topics that come out now, the, the phrase I've only fairly recently heard about called truth telling, which is about letting people know about acknowledging and recognizing the power of indigenous knowledge and its contributions it can make to our world today, instead of seeing it as some false narrative about myth and legend, of which it is neither. So I want to start off by showing you an image I think everybody's already seen before. This is just to reiterate for those who may not know, Aboriginal cultures in Australia are not homogenous. They are extremely diverse, and like any other con continent in the world, you have a number of nations. 250 at least major language groups, each with a distinct language, culture, and traditions going back who knows how long. Of course, when I learned from the elders, they said we've always been here. So one of the first things I, I had to learn about was, you know, these sort of false narratives that get thrown around 
about Aboriginal cultures as being nomadic, as being isolated hunter-gatherers, sort of wandering around aimlessly trying to eke out a living. And as a scientist, it was perfectly obvious that's total rubbish. All the evidence, the mountain, the Mount Everest of evidence is there, yet this is a very common popular narrative that gets repeated over and over ad nauseum in the public sphere and in the media. Learning about things like trade networks that go all the way across the country for you know, trade and ceremony, it was connection with Polynesians, Micronesians, uh, not, uh, Polynesians, uh, Melanesians, Indonesians. There's trade network, there's comet, commerce, there's systems going on. This is not just isolated little groups of people wandering around. That was obvious to me, but it seems to be something that is quite difficult to convince a lot of people in the general public. And one particular term that I use is the one of science. And whenever I talk to people about science in a traditional or an indigenous context, so many times I get perplexed sort of, what are you talking about? What do you mean, indigenous science? What is that? I get a blatant look of skepticism. People don't believe. So what is science? This is kind of timely right now because the last couple of weeks have been very interesting. Um, when I started off a position after getting my PhD, I began working at the Nuragili Indigenous Center at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. And it was Professor Martin Nakata, a Torres Strait Islander academic, um, who is now the PVC Indigenous at JCU in Townsville. He's the one who gave me a job. He's the one who mentored me uh, in an academic sense. Uh, he helped me. Uh, he taught, taught me so much. And I've been on country with him. I've been up in the Straits with him over the years. And at the time, he wanted me to develop a course for the university in the Indigenous Studies program on Indigenous science. So I wrote a course called The Science of Indigenous Knowledge. This is back in 2014. I had no idea that five short years later, this would be plummeted all over the media as another example of social justice warriors gone mad, political correctness, culture wars, rah, 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 you know, comparing it to creationism and, and astrology. And I'm like, I wrote this. <laughs> I've got a background in food. What are you talking about? And this has been making the rounds. And even a few days ago on Twitter, um, there was some journalists kind of ranting on and challenging. You get trolls all the time, of course, saying this isn't real science, blah, blah, blah. Oddly enough, these are the same people who reject climate science, who reject a lot of other sciences. Um, but then as Marcia Langton pointed out to me, it really is what those people has nothing to do with science. It has to do with their false belief in the superiority of Western civilization. And that in itself is a whole other issue. But to see so much skepticism about a topic people don't know anything about, why is it science is such a challenge for people to accept when you talk about it in an indigenous context? Science is a human endeavor. It's like art. It's like music. All of us, all cultures around the world, try to understand the world we live in. And if we're going to survive for very long, we've got to put knowledge systems around that. We've got to be able to observe and look at things and figure stuff out. There's a lot of different ways of doing science. It's like art or music. How many different types of art or music are there? It seems almost infinite. Science isn't terribly different from that. There's a lot of different ways it can be done. There's a lot of different ways it's applied. Many of the people in the room, including myself, are scientists. I know there are many people in the audience who are Aboriginal, Torres Strait, or Indigenous from other parts of the world who are probably doing science as well. You can see the two different systems and how they work together. But at the core, what is science? If you ask a scientist what science is, you're probably going to get a pretty narrow definition. You know, a lot of people will give the definition when you learn in grade school. You come up with an idea, you have a hypothesis, you test that hypothesis, you know, from the evidence, you know. And in reality, how often do we really do science that way? You know, half the time we have no idea what the hell we're looking at, you know. We're trying to figure stuff out, and then later on we're like, oh, well, that's interesting, and we're going off in different tangents. We kind of know the reality of how science works. It's about trying to understand the world around us through empirical observation, through deduction, through evidence, through verification, seeing how systems work together, and having some kind of predictive purpose for that. Now, the way predictive application can be in indigenous science, for example, versus Western science, is a little bit different. But at the end, it's about how can we take that knowledge and apply it? How can we take that knowledge and try to predict the future? When I say predict the future, I'm not talking in crystal balls and astrology. I'm talking how can we try to see how this system is going to help us learn about changing seasons? about weather, about the behavior of plants or animals, about the outcome of some kind of situation.
That's what we talk about when we say science. That's a very base level. You have Western science, you have indigenous science, folk science, however you want to look at it. Now, this is probably not the best Venn diagram I could pull off the, off the web. It's obviously from the US. But both systems try to, un, you know, both are trying to explain complex systems. Now, one of the things that comes up a lot, and, and Professor Nakata had noted this to me several times, Western science, we're trying to find universal truths or universal facts, uh, things that apply everywhere, especially if you're working in physics. Now, obviously, if you're I mean, marine biologists, you're looking at how systems might work in a specific area. But the point is, we're trying to figure out things in a larger context, a larger scale. But oftentimes, we're fairly narrow in our fields. A lot of us might not want to admit it, but we know how academia works, we know how science works. And everybody likes to fragment their little silos, and oftentimes there's not a lot of connection between them. Um, I know the astronomy community, you get the physicists and the astronomers splitting off, the astronomers split off between the observers and the theorists, and the observers split off between the radio and the optical, and then the, the infrared, and the long, wa uh, long wavelength radio, or short wavelength radio, or the modelers. Everybody gets in their little silos and their little communities. And I've even had um, some astrophysicists talking to me the last few months and say, one of them in particular was saying they were doing some modeling of stellar systems and trying to understand some of the nuclear synthesis going on. And they were working on this problem for a while, and they decided to go to a, a nuclear physics conference. Not one about astrophysics, just a nuclear physics conference. And they presented the talk, and there were people in the audience saying, we figured that out like 20 years ago. Where the hell have you been? So we get very siloed in academia, whereas indigenous science is very holistic. It's trying to see how systems work together, how these things link together. It's not easy to separate one thing from the other. Trying to understand the physical world, it is based on empirical observation. And people often say, oh, well, there's all these myths and legends, and, and you know, how, how, do, how do people survive if, if they believe? You know, people frame this in some kind of superstition. There's one thing I've learned from the elders over the years. They're very pragmatic. You know, this is, these stories I'll talk about in a minute are a way of transferring this knowledge over time. They're not dogmatic. They're not fighting over who's, you know, whose story is right and whose story is wrong, but they're meant to be, uh, in some cases, a little bit more symbolic. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute when I talk about orality and how long oral traditions can last over time. But it requires verification. You have to know these things are going to work, and you have to figure out what plants you can eat, what's, what's going to be good medicines, you know, and this stuff is tied very closely together. I'm going to give you many examples of this today that link to astronomy, and I'm going to tie this in with some of these major anchor points that talk about science itself. And of course, you've got applied goals. It's important that we understand how these systems work, because I think this is where a lot of the confusion arises. People see the stories, and in most cases, most people in the general public know the preschool version of Aboriginal oral traditions, and they think that's it. They think that's the level. And I, I'm, I'm imagining that's why so many people in the public, well, in addition to the 200 plus years of blatant racism going on, that that's one of the reasons. And it's not. Oral traditions are a way, in Western science, when we have a research result, we publish it. It's written down. But if you don't have or don't use a written system, you have to commit everything to memory, how are you going to do that? Are we going to list long, dry, you know, long, boring, dry lists of facts? No. But you have to have ways, creative ways, for the brain to be able to memorize things. Now, to give you some context about the amount of information we can remember, in Navajo traditions, the Navajo have categorized and classified 700 species of insects. Um, that's, you know, it's not actually that remarkable in that world. I think to most of us in this room, that'd be surprising. How, how would somebody memorize all that? We don't have to memorize anything today. We have this damn thing here, University of Google, right? You want to know something? You look it up. I know not everybody in the room uses Google, but... <laughs> the point being is if you're going to have oral traditions, or if you're going to have information you pass on, oral traditions, song, dance, artistic practices, craftsmanship, these are really creative ways of being able to commit them to memory. And it works by using the method of loci. Now, I'm sure a lot more people in the room are going to know way more about this than I do. I remember it was a few years ago, somebody won the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology on proving or demonstrating that the human brain utilizes the method of loci. Now, I know where I am and who I'm talking to. Who remembers the name of those people? 
It was medicine. I kind of figured since I'm here, somebody would know that. <laughs> Gonna embarrass the hell out of myself. Nobody else knows good. I don't feel so bad now. Anyway, the point is humans have evolved to associate a memory with a place. A place could be a device like this thing in my hand. Um, it could be the texture or a color or a feeling. It could be the landscape. It can be the stars, and the stars is a big one. Uh, Lynn Kelly, a colleague of mine, Dr. Lynn Kelly, wrote a couple of books on memory, one called The Memory Code and a very recent one called Memory Craft, and it ties into this. And I was going to try to utilize her technique to memorize all the, all the 88 Western constellations using my hands. Um, I didn't get very far. I only got to about the first, you know, 10 or so, seven or eight, whatever. But even, that was like four weeks ago, and I haven't touched it in four weeks, and today I was thinking, like, I wonder if I remember any of that. And I was like, okay, and going through my hand, I'm like, oh, I actually remembered them, even though it was four weeks ago, and I only, only practiced doing it for 10 minutes. But don't ask me to do it right now. <laughs> but it was a great way to associate memory with place. So, moving on. Observation. Observation is critically important. It's how we understand the world around us. Empirical observation that we can utilize to test ideas, test hypotheses. It's kind of framed in a very Western scientific way of seeing things. What I'm trying to get at is this is not unique to Western science. You find this in indigenous traditions as well. In astrophysics, we have something called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It's a way astronomers can classify stars based on their temperature, and their luminosity. It really is a color chart because how we classify stars is based on their color. The red stars are the very old stars. They burn their energy very slowly, these M-class stars. They're fairly cool on the surface, only a few thousand degrees, and it kind of goes up. The hotter the stars are, the shorter their life spans, and I'm not gonna go into all the deep astrophysics behind it. But one of the things that I found interesting is that there are different aboriginal communities that have their own classification systems of stars. And classifying things is kind of a part of science as well. How do we distinguish, distinguish one thing from the other? How do we classify them? It's not universal, but it's a very common feature. In the Larucha stellar classification system, they look at stars based generally on red and white. Jokera are the white stars, Tathaka are the red stars. The reddish white stars, like our sun, more Tathaka, Jokera, and Tathaka and Dora are the very red stars. Now, these very red stars seem to play a pretty special role in the traditions. They seem to really stand out against most of the other stars. I find them often associated with very important, significant characters in the traditions. Remembering, of course, that the story is just a way to encompass all the knowledge and tell it and pass it down. Now what you'll notice is, I was, I was actually curious, I'm like, how many of the stars that we see in the sky fit into these categories? And these Tataka and Dora, these bright red stars, are only 3% of all the stars we see in the sky. Some examples of that would include, who, who knows, knows some of the bright red stars? Just yell it out. Antares, good. Because we're gonna talk about that one first. I swear that's not a placement in the crowd. <laughs> I'm not a storyteller, and it's not really appropriate for me to try to tell the aboriginal stories. All I'm going to do is give you a couple of anchor points about them. There is a story of Wyangari from the Naranjeri people of the Kurong in South Australia, down south of Adelaide. And the tradition talks about this young man named Wyangari. He's an initiate. And during the period of initiation, he has to go a period of time in a sacred state called a Narambi. And during this time, he has to be ochred up. He can't wear clothes, he can't eat food, and he can't have any contact with people. In fact, Wyangari means red man. Um, what happens at the end of the tradition is he breaks some sacred taboos. Um, he, he had an affair with two women he wasn't supposed to because that kind of um, activity was strictly forbidden during this period of initiation. They faced, uh, he, oh, everybody disappeared, all right. <laughs> He faced, and the two women faced, death as a potential punishment for breaking this taboo. So to escape, he cast a spear into the Milky Way and pulled himself and the two women up a rope where they are now in the Milky Way as a bright red star. The two uh, women are on either star, stars on either side of him. And every spring, this constellation, these stars are really high in the sky at sunset, signifying the start of what we think of as spring. Um, the plants and the animals are going to be doing their thing, coming out of the wintertime. And he also occasionally gets hotter and brighter. 
And when it gets hotter and brighter, it signifies to the people that they need to not give in to their sexual tendencies. They need to watch out for themselves. And that element of this tradition talks about the importance of following sacred traditions and not breaking taboos. So this idea about a star getting sort of brighter and fainter over time is quite curious. Now, the early missionaries and anthropologists who recorded these traditions back at starting in the 1840s <laughs> didn't have a lot of training in astronomy. And this becomes a very significant reoccurring theme throughout all the work that I do. A lot of the ethnographers not knowing much about astronomy. And when they write things down, they conflate terms. They misidentify, mischaracterize things. Things are recorded incorrectly. And what happened in this case is the people, the anthropologists, whoever they are, the ethnographers, said, well, why in Gary the red man must be Mars? It's bright, red, and whenever he comes up high in the sky, it signifies the start of spring, and they throw all the symbolism in there, which didn't make a lot of sense to me, but okay. And because Mars is a planet, sometimes it's further away from us in the solar system, sometimes it's closer to us, it can be different brightnesses. So that talked about how Wyangari was sometimes brighter and sometimes fainter. A colleague of mine in Adelaide, uh, Philip Clark, sent me a paper about two years ago that he had written in the 90s about all the different variations of the Wyangari story. And he said, Dwayne, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that Wyangari is Mars. Can you look over this and give me your thoughts and opinions? Now, I had never read anything about the story before. And I read through his paper and I said, well, it's very obvious it's not Mars. It's very obvious it's the star Antares. I can give you 16 different reasons why. One of them, of course, the obvious one being that planets are constantly wandering around. They're never at the same point in the sky every time of the year. But everything fit with Antares. This is the center of the galaxy, the center of the Milky Way right here. He's a bright red star. The way they described him being in the celestial canoe near the emu in the sky, which is down here, everything fit. And I felt pretty happy letting him know, okay, well, they messed up. It's actually, it's actually Antares, not Mars, which is kind of ironic because Antares means the anti-Ares or the rival of Ares. Who was Ares in Greek mythology? The Greek god of war. Mars is the Roman god of war, right? So what this literally means is not Mars. <laughs> So much for that. So, and, and the reason for that, of course, I mean, you'll recognize this is Scorpius, Scorpio. The ecliptic passes through this, which means it's one of the constellations of the zodiac. And because the planets are all in the same, uh, roughly in the same plane, Mars sometimes clumps close to Antares. They're similar in brightness. They're both red. They're both rivals fighting for dominance in the sky, which, of course, is described in a lot of aboriginal traditions as well. But what I'm getting at about Antares is something that's really I found really remarkable. What's this brightening and fading of, of Wyangari over time? Antares is a variable star. It changes by about a magnitude every five to six years. What this means is Aboriginal people have been watching this star for who knows how long and noting that over a period of several years, sometimes it's brighter and sometimes it's fainter. Now, you will notice a, a magnitude change, of course, in the brightness of the star, but you've really got to be paying attention. This is not something you're just going to casually look at. You've got to really be closely observing the stars all the time to be able to notice something like this. And the traditions were very clear about that. And I thought, well, this is amazing, because these kinds of pulsating variable stars were not discovered by Western science until the 1840s by Herschel. And here you have long-standing traditions that were recorded in the 1840s that are talking about the variability of this star. This is not the only example. You know, there's a, a tradition about Niruna. This is a common Seven Sisters song line that goes all across the country out in the desert. If anybody saw this song line tracking the Seven Sisters exhibition, at the National Museum in Canberra a couple years ago, it was all about this. Um, Orion, the, the Greek constellation of Orion, which is upside down here, is seen as Niruna, different variations of the story, who's upside down, incidentally enough. This is belt, tassel, you know, arms and legs, and, and many of the traditions, and even including the old Greek traditions, this is not the scabbard of a sword. <laughs> <laughs> It was the 1800s that the uh, very prudish Victorians decided they were going to refer to it as, oh, it's the 
scabbard of his sword. <laughs> and in a lot of traditions, it's exactly what it looks like if it's, a, if it's a man standing upside down. Point being is he's chasing the young sisters of the Pleiades, the Eugorilia sisters. This talks about the diurnal motion of the stars throughout the night, rising in the east and setting in the west. And you find this motif in cultures all around the world about this group of stars being a man or a group of men chasing that group of stars down there. And in the middle, you see what in Greek mythology is the horns of Taurus the bull is actually their eldest sister. Their eldest sister knows that Niruna, much like the Greek version of Orion, I hate using these comparisons, but it gives somebody some kind of anchor, gives everybody an anchor point to, to see what we're talking about and to show you some of the similarities across time and space. Very arrogant man, very attractive, very skilled hunter, but a total womanizer. And he's chasing the sisters. They're too young for him in the first place, and they have no interest. They're trying to get away from him. They're trying to hide. Their eldest sister knows what he's really about. They know he's really a coward, so she challenges him. And that V-shape of stars is her challenging him and making a mockery of him. And without going into all the gray details of the story, he wants her out of the way, so he creates fire magic in his right hand to cast at her to get her out of the way so he can access the younger sisters. She counters his fire magic by producing some of her own fire magic in her left foot in the star Aldebaran. His right hand is the star Betelgeuse. These are the, obviously the Western names. And there's this battle back and forth between her using her fire magic and kicking sand in his face and making fun of him, and all the other stars around laugh and mock him, and it humiliates him, and his fire magic dies down. But because he's the man he is, he, his fire magic comes back again. She's not able to create her fire magic in time, so she calls on Baba, the father dingo, to come in, and father dingo attacks Naruna, and they all sit back and laugh, and yeah, 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 make fun of him, and it shows the humiliation of Naruna, and his fire magic dies down again. So what is really interesting about this whole narrative, again, there's, there's a lot of different elements of science in here. There's a lot of different elements of, of culture tied into that. And you know, this is one of the, the major differences about indigenous astronomy and Western astronomy. Western astronomy takes out you know, this idea of supernatural causation and spirituality. It, tr it tries to push that out as much as possible, although the history of science doesn't really show that very well. But in indigenous science, you know, that is a part of the overall system. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a different way of trying to understand the world, but it's equally valid. It's not dependent on the verification of Western science. But it is standalone. But you do see this idea. So getting down to the point, these two stars are both variable. Aldebaran and Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse varies by one and a half magnitudes about every 400 days. I'm going to throw a little science graph up because I know everybody loves to see science. This is a light curve. This shows the brightness of the star over time. If the star didn't vary, this would be a straight line going across the board. Obviously, it varies. It's not quite periodic, but what you can get at when you do uh, an analysis, like a spectrum analysis, is the difference between the highest and the lowest is about one and a half magnitudes, which is definitely noticeable, and occurs on a time scale of about 400 days. What's also interesting is Aldebaran is variable. Very small variability, but definitely notable. Now, when I saw these traditions, we, we were quite surprised and thought, well, this is amazing. This is another example of stellar variability that, again, wasn't known until the 1840s by Western science. But something else popped out of the story that I thought was interesting. And it's the fact that these stars do not vary at the same rate. They vary at different rates. Betelgeuse is a little bit more periodic, semi-periodic. Semi Aldebaran's very weird. It can go long periods of time with nothing, and then short periods of time where it's doing a lot of variation. What this story talked about was not only the fact that both of these stars varied, but they varied at different rates, the relative periodicities. Naruna's fire magic was able to come back before the other sister was able to generate hers again. So it shows not only close observation about the fact that stars change in brightness, but talks about the changing uh, relative periods. Now, what's interesting about this is, as stuff I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, you can look at when the stars rise and set, and that can tell you things that you can learn about nature and about the world around you. But the variability of these stars doesn't have a real practical use when it comes to that sort of thing. So it was granted uh, a symbolic way of talking about social behaviors. So it's given a slightly different application. There are stories about, you know, much bigger examples about two brothers in a canoe um, 
a storm came in. They tried to paddle back to shore. The storm capsized their canoe. The eldest brother was older and more experienced, saved his younger brother at the cost of his own life. When the brother made it to shore, the people ran down to see what happened, told them the older brother had saved them. So they held a ceremony that night to celebrate uh, the heroism of the eldest brother. When they did that, a few days later, a bright new star appeared on the banks of the Sky River in the Milky Way, and it was the older brother telling everybody that he was safe with the ancestors. When the younger brother died, or was about to pass away, he asked the ancestors to place him in the sky with his older brother. They became the two stars known in Western astronomy as Shala and Lasath. Incidentally enough, right next to, can we get the, the front lights off for a second? It's better. These are the stars in the stinger of Scorpius. Right, you hear Scorpius here. Right on the banks of the Sky River, and by the banks we're talking the boundary between the light and the dark spaces in the Milky Way, there was a very bright supernova that occurred in the year 393. That exact location. Does that definitively mean this was a story describing a supernova? No, it doesn't. We've got to apply scientific rigor, but it certainly is a plausible example of an aberrational observation of supernova. Deduction. Boy, time's really flying by, isn't it? Deduction. How do you figure out how things work if you didn't see them or can't test that experiment necessarily? To give you a, an example of that, I'm going to talk about some meteorite craters. The story is covered in meteorite craters, and several of them have stories about their formation. And some of these stories are very interesting. One example, Henbury, occurred about 4,500 years ago when a nickel iron asteroid came barreling through the atmosphere, broke apart because of ram pressure, hit the ground, creating about 16 different craters. These are three of the biggest craters right in the middle of the site, sort of spread out over about a square kilometer. There are Luritia, that's the same community that had the stellar classification systems. Luritia traditions that talk about how this formed when a fire devil ran down from the sun, hit the ground, setting the land on fire, killing everybody, and creating these giant holes. And that even though this crater here, this is a creek, will fill with water after it rains, the people were forbidden from going in there because they were afraid the fire devil would fill it with iron again. Now, this is obviously a, a Western interpretation of the story that was told to them by the Lurich people, but it's a very clear, unambiguous description of exactly how this impact occurred four and a half thousand years ago. That gives you a little bit of testament to how long some of these traditions last, um, but that's, that's kind of nothing, really. We've got lots of examples of sea level rise that goes back 7,000 years, volcanism that goes back 10,000 years, and I'm about to publish a paper that looks at uh, geological and astronomical evidence that show some Tasmanian stories that go back 13,000 years. This is a long time. You know, where we talk about how old Stonehenge is, you know, 5,000 years ago, that's nothing compared to how old these traditions are and how long this knowledge can be passed down in time. But this is an observation, a record of an observation. What am I talking about deduction? So this is Auntie Mavis Malbunka. She is a Western Aranda custodian in the Central Desert. This is west of Alice Springs. She tells the story of Norla. The story of Norla, the basic synopsis is there were a group of women dancing as stars in the Milky Way. One of the women who had a baby, was carrying a baby, put it in a turna, a kulam in a wooden basket, set the baby down on the edge of the Milky Way, and they went off to continue having the dance ceremony. As they were dancing, it shook the baby off the Milky Way. The baby in the turna fell down to the ground as a star, hit the ground, drove all the rocks upwards, and that was basically the formation of the world. The others talk about this Corona Australis, this sort of U-shaped group of stars near the Milky Way, how that's the front of the turn. You can see it tumbling out of the Milky Way. Now, what's interesting about that, it's a place called Norla. Western scientists call it Goss's Bluff. This is a gigantic impact structure that was formed from a comet impact, low, impact, low density structure, about 142 million years ago. The land at the time was about a two kilometers higher than it is now, so what we see today is a result of differential erosion, and this is a central uplift of a complex meteorite crater. Don't need to remember all the gory details, but the fact this thing formed when a proverbial star, a comet, hit the ground, driving the rocks upwards. It's quite interesting. You look at the deduction between understanding how this structure forms and looking, that, looking at that from the crossroads of Western science and indigenous science and seeing these interesting synergies and things we can learn about.
You know, total solar eclipses is an example I love to learn more about. Uh, a lot of my colleagues are down in South America right now because a total solar eclipse just happened a few days ago across Chile and Argentina. Total solar eclipses only occur once every few hundred years from any given location on the Earth. And during my PhD, I was very curious, are there many Aboriginal traditions that talk about these things? They occur very quickly. Maximum time for total solar eclipse is about seven minutes, usually only for a few minutes, but they're quite remarkable events. Has anybody seen a total solar eclipse before? A few, okay. I went, saw the first one I ever saw was in Cairns in 2012, and it was an amazing, uh, almost spiritual experience. There are lots of traditions about eclipses all around the country, and most of them have a very clear central theme. In many Aboriginal cultures, not all, but a majority, the sun is a woman and the moon is a man. This event is described as them embracing in an act of love. Now, you have to know exactly where the moon is in the sky to realize how solar eclipses work. Because the moon, during this time, is the new moon phase. We can't see it. The back side of the moon is facing the sun. It's lit up. We're literally looking at the dark side of the moon. But if you're very carefully observing where the moon is throughout the month, throughout the year, throughout its lunar cycles, you can predict where it's going to be. And to have these traditions that go back as long as they do for something that's so short and so important is just more testament to the power of indigenous science. And again, it's a really remarkable way to see the crossroads of indigenous and Western science. Now, another really important aspect is to look at interconnectedness. How do things relate together? How can observing the positions of stars help us learn things that are happening on the Earth? There's a few themes that I've come across with all the elders. One of them is that everything on the land is reflected in the sky. The sky is a textbook. It's a law book. It tells you everything you need to know if you know how to read it. The elders always use the phrase, reading the stars. And that's reading the stars is how to observe the changes in the positions and properties of the stars to be able to tell you what's going to happen on the Earth. One of the most famous examples is the emu in the sky. It's a constellation not traced out by the bright stars, but by the dust lanes in the Milky Way itself. When it rises and sets throughout the year, it tells you different things about the behavior of the emu. The basic kindergarten story is when the emu rises at sunset, that's when you go and collect emu eggs. That's something that's becoming extremely well known across the country. You find similar traditions in South America, like at the top of Brazil, who see this not as an emu, but as a rhea a bird very similar to an emu or an ostrich. Very similar kinds of traditions, the exact same shape in the stars. But if you look at it from an aboriginal perspective, this is specifically the Uwalyi Gomeroy people of northern New South Wales, it's something quite different. At sunset, when the emu rises, this is April and May, it's the female emu, she's running across the horizon. She's running because she's chasing a mate. It's the females who chase the males for mating. And if you've ever seen a if you've ever seen a clutch of emu eggs like that, you know how big they are. You can imagine the amount of energy required for her to be able to produce and lay those. So she mates with the male, the male sits on the nest, and she goes off and does her thing, generating more energy. That occurs for about two months. At sunset, you kind of see the Milky Way kind of coming across the sky, straight across. It's now seen as a male emu sitting on the nest. He's incubating the eggs. Incubation period for eggs is about 58, 59 days, two months. That occurs in roughly June, July. As the Milky Way swings around throughout the year at sunset again, we see it perpendicular in the sky. This is now the male emu getting up off the nest. This occurs in August and September. Why is he getting up off the nest? Because the chicks are hatching. It's the responsibility of the males to rear the young. You also see this symbolized in initiation ceremonies. I'm not going to talk about the details of that for obvious reasons. But if you look at boar grounds, which are comprised, uh, uh, consisting of two circles connected by a pathway, they're reflected in the sky. And the elders told us that if you look at the boar on the ground, it will reflect the boar in the sky when it directly connects to the Milky Way. And the initiation process of the men bringing the boys into manhood is a reflection of the male emus rearing the young. As the emu flips around in the sky, it's sort of the, the people see it sort of shift position a little bit. And they now see it as the bum of the emu sitting on the horizon. It's finding the water holes and sitting in the water holes because the hot weather's coming. As it does that, it displaces the water, which evaporates, and the dry summertime comes. So Uncle Gillar Michael Anderson is the one who taught us about this.
Prediction, what time's flying by? I'm gonna go through another couple quick examples before we finish up. Stellar scintillation is something that I find quite fascinating. As an astrophysicist, the twinkling of stars is nothing but a hindrance, it's a problem. It gets in the way of us being able to take accurate measurements of stars, galaxies, whatever we're having to look for at through a telescope. And we spend huge amounts of money putting observatories on mountaintops or developing optical systems, or even billions putting telescopes in space to get away from the problem of stellar scintillation. What I learned from the elders is that stellar scintillation isn't a problem, it's a benefit. You can learn a lot from it if you know how to read it. And what the elders taught me is look at the stars and how they twinkle. Are they twinkling quickly? That means there's high wind. Are they twinkling slowly? That means there's slow wind. Are they not twinkling at all? It means there's no wind. Are the stars changing color? Are the stars appearing kind of fuzzy or are they very sharp? If you look at the stars and they're twinkling really rapidly, they appear kind of fuzzy and they look very blue, that means a storm is coming. And when the elder first told me that, his uncle Seagar Passy on Mare, in Torres Strait, taught me that, I thought, what does being blue have to do with it? What's he talking about? I went back and I thought about it. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. Yes, of course. How many people in here have had chemistry? I'm hoping a few, right? Another fun little science graph. This is looking at, at how much of the different wavelengths of light are absorbed by water. And if you look at this, you can see very clearly that red and green wavelengths of light, yellow wavelengths of light, are absorbed by water, whereas the blue and violet end of the spectrum are very poor at absorbing water. What that means is if there's a lot of humidity in the atmosphere, the stars are going to appear kind of fuzzy, and they're going to be blue, because that starlight coming in is getting filtered out by the moisture of the water in the atmosphere, and the blue light is what is coming through. So it was a really remarkable way of seeing how we can learn about different aspects of science by looking at how stars twinkle. I just, it, it was one of those things that sort of blew me away. I'd never heard about that before. As an astronomer, all we see is this being a real hassle, whereas the elder saw it as being a great benefit. Moon halos are another great example. You know, these predict rain, and the elders tell me, if you can count the number of stars inside the lunar halo, inside the, that ring, it might be several days before it rains, if at all. But if it's very fuzzy, can we get the lights on that? Sorry, a little bit hard even for me to see that. That's a little bit better. If you can't see any stars inside, it's gonna rain pretty quickly. And again, the reason for that, in both indigenous and Western science, very similar explanation. These halos in Western science are caused by ice crystals high in the atmosphere. Those ice crystals form in low fronts. Low fronts bring rain. Even looking at the angle of the moon cusps, everybody's seen this sort of Cheshire grin before in the sky? At least that's what I call it. The angle of these cusps, sometimes they're straight up and down, sometimes they're tilted. And that depends on where the moon and Earth system are throughout the year, as it's tilting, going from one solstice to the other. And communities around the world will talk about sometimes, if the wet season is when the cusps are pointing up, they'll say, well, it's filling up with water. That's the wet season. Later on, when it tilts, all the water pours out, and now it's dry. Some communities say, well, now's our dry season. It's filling with water. And later on, as it tilts, it's pouring the water out, and now it's a wet season. So, you know, we've got examples of the positions of the, moon, uh, the sun throughout the year. On Moa Island, the elders tell me about how the positions of the setting sun on this archipelago of islands, very specific to that one place, again, in situ, to that spot. If you look, you see where the sun sets relative to the islands in the background, and that can tell you a whole load of different things about the different seasons, about the turtles and the dugong, the migration patterns, their behavior, the breeding seasons, all this dictated by looking at that. And the last example I want to give is an application of how this is applied. That's Uncle Gilar up the top left corner there, and he taught us how you all you people would travel great distances from the northern end tip of New South Wales to Carnarvon Gorge in Queensland or the Bunya Mountains for trade in ceremony. And the way that people would develop these maps is you have to get from point A to point B. Once you figured out the best route, you had to figure out where to stop for water, where the best places for food are, where the best places for medicine, where the best places to camp are. You had to figure this route out and memorize all of that in the landscape. But you had to have a way of teaching it to the younger generations. How do you do that? Method of loci. You put it in the sky. You roughly find the stars that align to that orientation, and the stars serve as waypoints along your journey, and the pathways 
the sort of lines that connect them are your pathways. This is just one of them that goes from um, Kaduga to the Bunya Mountains. This is taught at night to the younger generations. Later in the year when these stars are up, people aren't walking at night following the star like you think of with stellar navigation. They've just memorized it. They've memorized the pathways, and they're traveling during the day. What's interesting is when the colonists first started spreading out across the country, and they came upon these communities, the Aboriginal people would take them and, and show them how to journey across the landscape and where to stop for food and where to stop for water and things like that. As the colonists did this, they go along these same tracks because that's where the Aboriginal people took them and where these tracks became pathways and became roads. These places where they stopped became settlements and became towns. And when you look at Google Maps today and you superimpose the star maps on Google Maps, you find something quite remarkable. They all sync up to the highway network system in the towns. A lot of the towns in Southeast Australia are signified by stars in these star maps. And the pathways between them that became roads actually coincide with modern highways. So this is another interesting way of taking an indigenous science and applying all, all that knowledge and then linking that to memory. So to finish off, because we've got 10 minutes left, the last thing I want to mention is something very obvious to everybody in the crowd. Why the hell is there a white American guy up here talking about this? <laughs> I understand my position in this. There's a very limited amount that I can do in this space. I'm a scientist, and I've, I've learned something about the social sciences, and I've worked with the communities to try, to try to bridge these two worlds together. Fortunately, today, there's a whole generation of Aboriginal people who were studying astrophysics who can provide a perspective to this work that I can't provide. I don't have that cultural experience. I don't have that lived experience. I don't have that connection to country. So these are some of the people who are becoming very famous nowadays. Dr. Stacy Mater down here, he's a Gidja man from the very tip of WA. He, as far as I know, is the only PhD qualified Aboriginal person who's an astrophysicist. He works at the CSIRO. Um, Kirsten Banks has very recently become quite popular. She's been on Q&A and The Drum. Uh, Carly Newman was on SBS. She's been on Stargazing, Li Stargazing Live. Crystal's been doing some amazing stuff here in Melbourne. I've only met the, the two Pete's fairly recently. This is a new generation who are talking about this. This is the new generation who are going to be the faces of this. Most of them, except for Dr. Mater, undergraduates, postgraduate students, and in time, we're working on a transitionary phase. We're meant to, I'm helping to mentor them in various projects they're working on, but more importantly, looking at how we can provide pathways to get a whole pipeline of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students who can come in and do their degrees in all these different areas of science. But even more importantly than that, how we can integrate and properly put indigenous knowledge into the science curriculum across the university. And that's one of the things I've been tasked with helping to do. It's not going to be an easy task. I've got a lot of people I have to consult with and bring into this process. But it's one of the things we're trying to do across the entire faculty of science. Because when these students come in, all students need to learn about indigenous knowledge, all students. But it's also very important when these Aboriginal students come in, they see that their culture is being respected, it's being understood, it's being acknowledged, and they're actually learning part of that alongside with the Western science. So this is something that we're doing right now, and it's, it's one of the things I'm very passionate about. So to finish off, to allow a few minutes for Q&A, if you want to learn anything more about this, on the website, aboriginalastronomy.com.au, you can find the national curriculum, you can find videos, links to our papers, everything on this website. Thanks. Um, hi, there you go. Thank you for the presentation, it was wonderful. Um, my name's Levi Mackenzie Kirkbright. Um, I'm a Ewan, Eora, and Gamilaro man. Um, been down here for about eight years now. 
Um, so a little bit of background about me. Uh, I did my Bachelor of Biomedicine here at the uni and I'm now doing my Master's of Engineering. So, <clears throat> and I also fell in love with astronomy when I was a kid. So I really love astronomy, I love science and I almost did astronomy instead of biomedicine, um, which might have set my life on a different trajectory. Um, but one of the things I'm struggling with as an Indigenous person in STEM fields is uh, the conversation at the moment that's going around STEM uh, or science and Indigenous knowledges. Um, so I'd one, I was wondering if I could maybe get a little bit of a response from you. Um, I guess I fundamentally disagree with the equivocation between Indigenous knowledge systems and science. I think it's another tacit um, ploy to try and get us to seek approval from non-Indigenous Australians and non-Indigenous people that we have to somehow play a game where we validate ourselves by trying to equate ourselves to your science systems. And I don't think that's a game that we should be playing. Um, so that's the first thing that I want to say. Um, and that's in light of all the amazing work that people like yourself, um, of course, wonderful Misty down here or Uncle Bruce Pascoe are doing. I understand the game that is trying to be played, but for non-Indigenous people, I don't see why our knowledge systems should need to be equivocated to your knowledge systems in order to be seen as valid or somehow at the same level. So I, first of all, to take disagreement with that. Um, and secondly, I think it's important to remember that these knowledge systems were embedded in uh, mythological structures or uh, they have deep, deep moral implications. Um, so pre-Descartes and pre-Hume, um, sciences like alchemy or astrology, um, when you touched on interconnectedness, they actually had interconnectedness to humans. So they came along with moral implications about how we should act in the world. And what science has done is, uh, in a very powerful way, um, that has yielded very powerful results, has stripped of, has stripped our observations of the empirical world of moral implications. Um, but I think when you're studying indigenous knowledge systems, it's important to remember that they were created with moral implications and by trying to reinterpret them in an amoral way, you're actually stripping them of some of the most important parts. Um, for example, uh, so my reasoning for this is that if an oral tradition has survived 60 to 100,000 years and part of the reason why it survived is because it has moral implications, then uh, by kind of selective reasoning, there's a reason those stories have lasted for so long. Uh, that being the longer they've lasted, the more moral importance they have. So they actually carry moral importance about how to live on this land for Indigenous and also non-Indigenous people now. And I just think that that should be remembered not to strip these things of their moral uh, implications because they actually do teach us about how this land needs to be respected uh, from not just a practical scientific or uh, materialistic point of view, but also from a moral point of view. No, I do agree. And one of the things that's come up quite a bit in this work is that there's been a debate, a debate about equivalency, and one thing that I've, I've spoken about um, and learned about is that they're not the same. It's not necessarily about, and I see a lot of that happening, they're trying to equate the two. Um, what, I, what I learned from the elders, one thing that was told to me many times is we're not just a people of culture, we're people of science, and it's about how those two are embedded within each other, as you just said. Um, so what, I, what I've been trying to look at here, it's been very tricky for me as, as a scientist and a non-Indigenous person to come into this space um, I find it very tricky now, you know, even coming in with this position. I don't often have a, an existen existential crisis trying to figure out, should I even be here? What am I even doing? Um, I usually try to give these talks with, with appropriate uh, elders and, and students I'm working with, which today for NADOC we wasn't able to happen. But I've been working a lot, you know, in particular with Martin Nockett on the cultural interface. You know, where, not necessarily quite, not, not showing that they're the same, but showing and trying to get people to understand that they should be respected in the same way, that they're both equally valid in their own right. And indigenous knowledge, as you mentioned already, is not subject to the validation of Western science. It's, that's not why we're trying to do this. Um, it is about looking at the crossroads between those two areas. And for me, it's quite a challenge. I mean, I see a lot of the culture and the morals behind that. I feel strange talking about that sometimes. I know as a scientist, what I try to do is see those multiple layers of the knowledge systems. I'm trying to take out one layer. I know it's very narrow and it's a very Western way of doing it, but I'm trying to look at some of the astronomical aspects. But that's why I'm looking and working with some of the colleagues who are doing stuff in those other areas that aren't necessarily as appropriate for me to be working in and trying to show how I can, I can make a small contribution to the larger picture and we can build that up. But a lot of times, you know, it, 
it, that's been one of the big challenges of the last few weeks is being people saying, oh, well, they're, they're nowhere near the same. I'm like, yeah, they are very similar. But then the, that sort of the pendulum swinging the other way says we're trying to equate them. We're not trying to equate them. But at the fundamental level, science is done in very similar ways by different cultures around the world. But you're right, Western science strips it of its culture, strips of it its social meaning, strips of it of any kind of morality, whereas yeah, obviously indigenous science doesn't. And that's the main thing that, um, one, of, one of the main differences between them. So yeah, it's, it's, it's something we're, we're trying to get across. I'm trying to get across in this work, but it's also one of the reasons I'm so keen to try to help support the voices and positions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this space. Because I can't necessarily, I mean, I can talk about it, but I don't come from that, that background to be able to do that necessarily. It also means <laughs> I may have to do some serious retraining for myself in the next few years. Because um, e even coming in with this position, I was like, oh my god, what am I doing? How am I going to how am I going to work this out? You know, I had many conversations with Marcy Langton about this. So yeah, it's a tricky position for me to be in. But it's why we're phasing out me and phasing in some of these Aboriginal students working in this space. Now, one very quick question for you, Dwayne. You have some Slido up on the screen. Um, the question is, how did you become involved in Indigenous science? I, as an undergraduate student doing physics in the US, our degrees are very broad, so we can take a whole, you know, I was required to take several courses in social sciences and, and, and um, humanities. And growing up, I had a, a love for geography and for learning about history and archaeology and different cultures. And I chose the path, and my main obsession, really, was astronomy, so I chose that. But as I was going through my studies, I was getting really interested in both of those worlds. So I tried to see if I could find a way that I could include my interest in those two areas. So I had made the choice to do astrophysics, but like I said, I got the, the draw to, to, to cross these two areas became too strong, and that's why I started learning about Aboriginal astronomy. I uh, started learning about the science behind uh, the traditions, and then learning about this area. They used to call it ethnoscience, and I really don't like that term anymore. Um, learning about indigenous science and a different way of understanding the world that's kind of similar to Western science in some ways, but obviously is also quite different. And yeah, just trying to, to understand how that works. Thank you. Now, I'd encourage everyone to follow Dwayne on Twitter. It will connect you in with the students that he highlighted. Um, the girls in particular are doing some amazing science communication work at the moment with TEDx Talks as well as a number of news facilities at the moment. Um, and I'd just like to take a moment to thank Dwayne for being brave enough to stand here with us today to share his cultural journeys and to get us started on some quite difficult conversations. Thanks, Dwayne.